How many of you have ever heard an ancient Roman saying like this? While there is life, there is hope. While there is life, there is hope. How many of you agree with that? Can I see a hand? Watch out. I asked the same question this morning to the Spanish speaking group, and several fell into the trap. I've heard that saying, I think, all my life. My, my mother was one of those who, uh, I think she probably memorized over a hundred refranes, uh, you know, uh, in Proverbs. In Proverbs. Yeah. She didn't know how to read or write, but boy, she was very wise. And those sayings that she picked up through her, her, her lifetime, uh, she instilled them in me, and this is one of them. Hijo, mientras que hay vida. I esperanza. I say, well, thank you, mom. And I never really understood that until just recently, as I opened the book of First Peter. I invite you to come with me, please, First Peter chapter one. We're not going to get very advanced in chapter one. It's just I'm just I'm just going to attempt to give you an introduction. It's going to be a long introduction, but I need you to understand one thing before we can even get into. Um, uh, the solid material in this letter, we need to establish some foundation. <laughs> I'll probably spend one full service just talking about that first line, Pedro, or Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is not put here by accident. This is intentional. And it's really what everything in the epistle is holding on to. We don't understand this first line, especially the second sentence. Peter is just the name, but then Jesus Christ, the Lord. If we don't understand that, then and any, every, all the hope that Peter is going to be speaking about in this epistle has really no meaning. While there is life, there is hope. Of course, this is an ancient Roman saying, I don't know how old it is. And it's still quoted today, and like most adages or uh, uh, sayings, it has an element of truth, but no guarantee of certainty. It is kind of saying, just have hope on hope. Well, how do you do that? You're not holding on to anything. You can only have hope or have strong hope if you have something to rest on. So the idea of whether well, there's life, there is hope, yeah, yeah in, in a sense, but you better put your hope in the right thing or the right person. It is not the fact of life that determines hope, but the faith in which you place um, your life. Or the, 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 am I saying that correctly? Uh, the, the faith, how you, where you place your life, your hope, that will determine everything. And I, I'd like you to turn to chapter 1, we're not we're starting with verse 1, but I want you, want you to see a couple of verses that I think are, need to be outlined first of all. Chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto, you better write that, and I line that and I underline that, a living it's a living hope because it stands on a living Savior, on an eternal Savior, onto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So as a Christian believer, a Christian believer has living hope because his faith and hope are in God. Just move over to verse 21. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Let's pray. Father, when we open the epistle of Paul to the Colossians, the idea there was to help us understand that we don't have to go beyond Christ to be complete. We are complete in you. And all the treasures are hidden in you. We don't have to 
go beyond and to the eons and try to find something else that would just complete us. If we keep on searching, we keep on digging in, having a, a close relationship with you, Father, we will finally understand that in you we are complete. And now as Peter opens this epistle, he kind of goes into the same idea. <laughs> if you're going to go through hard times in life as a Christian, if you're going to live piously for the Lord Jesus Christ, we will suffer persecution. So what do we hold on to? What's going to be a hope when things get difficult? It is the Lord Jesus Christ, our living hope. And Lord, I pray as we open this epistle and move on later on, later in the weeks and months, because <coughs> there's so much here, Lord, to chew on. I pray that you will illumine us so that we can understand the first line in this letter. The Lord, Jesus, cries at the foundation. Without that, this letter has no hope. And so Lord, I pray that you will give me freedom to preach this afternoon. Give me the words I need. Sometimes my mind goes into Spanish mode and I have a hard time trying to build the sentences for it. I need you. Actually, we, I think we all need you because Lord, it's not just about me bringing a message, it's about all of us, all of us registering, acknowledging this message and applying it in our own life. If we're going to hold on, Lord, it's uh, strong in the years to come and I think we all suspect that we're facing difficult times. We're going to be heading towards difficult times. Lord, then I think understanding the truth in this epistle will be fundamental. I pray, Lord, that you truly will be uh, our rock. And Lord, be with us in the next half an hour, 45 minutes, as we uh, go into, into, as we introduce uh, ourselves into this epistle. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The living hope is a major theme of this letter. Paul I mean, Peter, as um, there, there's a, a construction here for Peter, there's no doubt, I think, uh, who wrote the letter. The first name? Peter. It ends, it starts with Peter, it ends with Peter, having somebody that's helping him out writing the epistle. This seems to be something common, and, and the Apostle Paul also had um, uh, es escribanos, or writers, to uh, assist them as the Holy Spirit was um, bringing the word and Peter's um, having that same assistance. He's got the Holy Spirit giving him the message and he has somebody that writing the words and so we have, for, we'll be looking into this Peter and the, the first thing, you know, I was really wanting to get into the epistle. I said, I know what I want to do. I want to drive right into the, the meat and uh, I want to go directly into verse 3. Just make a short introduction, Sam. They don't need a long introduction. And the more I thought about it, I said, wait, hold your horses. Why did the Lord bring this letter to an individual with so many defects, who had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ so many times? Peter. He kind of comes in, like knocking on the door and says, hi guys. The Lord sent me. I have a message for you. And the guy is there saying, you don't understand, we need somebody really strong, somebody who really has it all together. We need somebody who's never failed. Well, then I'm not the right one for you. I'm just Peter. But remember this, this epistle was written over 30 years later. This is not written right after the four Gospels. This is not somebody who has just spent three years with the Lord and then simply gets into ministry. No, this is a man who's been challenged from, you know, has been hit from every direction. Understanding that Jesus Christ is truly who he said he was. Boy, it took him a while for Peter to get that down. 
For three years, he thought he had it all right. Lord, I'm going to follow you whatever it takes. I know you're going to be the next one in charge, so I want to be the second one in charge. Jesus died and said, well, nobody's in charge. Let's go home. Now that Peter has grown. You know, I hope there's a message there just, just with that idea. I hope that as you come to Christ and then years go by, that you don't stay a baby. That even though you go through, you know, uh, you, know uh, you, you get buffeted from every direction, that you get through that and you grow through that. So it starts with a man who wrote it. Then who, does, who did it write it to? Well then, that's why it took me two weeks to more to de decide, well, you know, if I don't have, I have the writer, but who is he writing to? If I don't have that right, then I might be going in the wrong direction. Who is he writing to? Then, you know, since I'm not a very good at grammar and uh, not a good historian, I, I try to get help from those who do know, and uh, guess what? They don't know. You get all the different commentaries, and boy, this I, who who did it write it to? Go, it, it's all over the map. He went to the, he wrote to the Jewish Christians, and because he wrote it to the Jewish Christians, then this is the direction that this epistle is going. Then you have others say, no, 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 no. It, now the Jewish they're not, they're not in, in, in in the mind of Peter here. Although he was an apostle to the Jews, he has that Christians would be persecuted. Those were Gentiles. So this letter goes in that direction. And so guess what I found? I was in trouble. What direction am I going to go? Then you find somebody who uh, kind of said, well, it kind of goes both ways. It uh, doesn't really matter if it's Jews or Gentiles. There's a message there for all of them. In fact, it goes beyond those Jews or Gentiles 2,000 years ago. It's it goes to us, it's really speaking to us, and I hope we get some practical instruction here that we understand that this is not something that Peter wrote 2,000 years ago to certain individuals, and we can come clean and go home and say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me. No, this has everything to do with you and me. So whether you're from Luxembourg, you're from Britain, Great Britain, or uh, Japan, or Nigeria, Philippines, from down under, kind of, Australia. If you are a born-again Christian, the message that Peter has here is urgent for us to understand. Because I believe that difficult times are coming. If you've been looking at the news, you've probably realized that uh, things are not getting better. Things seem like governments and countries are in trouble. You hear riots going on everywhere. Uh, seems like, uh, Muslim communities in Europe are just rebelling and uh, either they're kicked out or they take over. Of course, from this part of the world, in La Costa del Sol, you don't see any of that. You think, is that really happening? I look out my window, see the beautiful Mediterranean, then see those beautiful white houses in a nice afternoon with a nice cup of coffee, and I'm thinking, well, life is good. It can't get any uh, worse. It's going to be like this. No, no. Uh, the, uh, right over that horizon, the, the world is falling apart. And sooner or later, folks, it's going to get to us. And understanding the, this epistle will be very helpful if we're, going to be, if we're going to survive. Now, in order to give you a map of what uh, we're going to be uh, studying in the future, I... I, uh, I've got a, an outline that I think will help you project. It's all about grace. If you want to know, if you want a, a word that will help you understand what grace is, think of it as enablement. What you don't have, God enables you to have freely. So Peter is talking here to different Christians all over the world saying, listen folks, believe me, I've been there, I've done that, and I've had all the sticks and stones trying to break my bones. I know what it's all about. You need this message. It's all about grace. And remember this also, this is a very important detail, that right after First Peter comes, Second, Second Peter. Peter. And right after Second Peter comes, death. <laughs> Peter would not be living very long after Second Peter. His death was just around the corner. It was writing this 
incredible letter of hope. And, and even with a smile, because he talks about this joy in hope. Not realizing that a few probably months, maybe a year or two later, you'll be in joy, in perfect joy, in bliss with the Lord in heaven. Probably remembering what he wrote here, saying, wow, I couldn't have been more right. Look, this is what I was writing about, what I'm enjoying right now. So what is the letter about? It's, it kind of divides in three sections. The, 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 the grace in salvation starts with verse 3 and it ends in chapter 2, verse 10. And how does that work? Well, we need that grace to live with hope, living in hope. And then living in holiness. In other words, if things get worse bad, don't hide, don't imitate the world, don't de uh, uh, negate or don't deny the Lord Jesus Christ like Peter uh, remembered he did. No, no. Living in holiness. Be dedicated to Him. Living in holiness doesn't mean just having a nice clean suit and having a shower every day. It means living dedicatedly, uh, dedicated wholeheartedly to the Lord from beginning to the end. Now that's, that's a mouthful. I don't know if the, the Lord put the words in Brother Tim's mouth a few minutes ago when he said, remember David, remember Noah, remember these. And, you know, they started pretty well, but some of them ended up, ended up pretty bad. I found out not too long ago, I'm making a preparing about a series. It'll probably end up in a series that many of the patriarchs, both in the Old and New Testament, didn't end well. They started well, but they didn't end well. Peter said we can end well. We can end living for the Lord all the way to the end, living in holiness. And then when things really get tight and you feel like going around screaming and saying, okay, this is it. <coughs> no, no, he says, live in harmony. You don't have to panic. The Lord is still in control. And we'll see that in verses 22 uh, all the way to chapter 2, verse 10. So the first point, the first section, will be speaking about salvation and how we need to live out this salvation. Hope, holiness, harmony, just so that you, re you can remember all with H. And by the way, these first points, they all end with an S. God, God's grace in salvation, God's grace in submission, God's grace in suffering. No, I don't want to get to that one. Not soon, at least. <laughs> so salvation. There's hope. If you haven't received this salvation, only to look to the... No, no, you can live this salvation out here. Enjoy it here. And show a testimony. Live in harmony. Live in holiness. Live hopefully. You don't have to panic when everybody seems to be going broke. And then, as soon as Paul or Peter... Um, opens chapter 2 there in verse 11 all the way to chapter 3 verse 12 he changes direction kind of and says oh I want to talk to you about this grace that also works in your submission and now he gets into different areas of life just like Paul did when he got into when he when he um, Paul opened up Colossians submission to the authorities no we don't want to do that you mean corrupt authorities how many of you are good submitting to corrupt authorities I keep on hearing what ha what's happening in the States here in Spain and different people, you know, corrupt government, getting rich out of your taxes. They have no problem emptying out your, your pockets, just laying out more and more and more what seems to be very unfair taxes. Preparing Lord the law that only benefits the crook and not the everyday citizen. You, you, you see that, you say, are you kidding? I'm supposed to be submitting to the authorities? I'm supposed to be, uh, uh, can I get a little baseball bat at least? A little one, just a little one? I was telling people this morning, I said, I'm the kind of guy that kind of responds. The first reaction I have when I see unfairness, when I see unjust behavior is, where's my biggest baseball bat? How many of you are like that? I had a couple, I had three this morning, he said, there I am with you. Of course, I have a, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Spirit takes in immediately, and he says, "Hey, 
uh, like the same thing. Uh, you know, he kind of puts in the, the, the how do you say it? The spirit. The, the, the spoilers. The spoilers. I mean, I, I'm not a cowboy, so I don't know. That's the spoilers. Now he says, submit in, uh, to the authorities. And he said, but Peter, what are you talking about? Are, are, are you, are you, have you gone crazy? In a world, in the 21st century, living this way seems to be nonsense. No, no, what you do with corrupt authorities is you rebel against them, right? You join the guys out there wanting to fight back. And Peter says, no, 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 that's not the guy, that's not God's way. <coughs> See, they've lost hope. And they try to pay, uh, uh, do it their way, but you need to understand that God has not lost control. God is still in control. So he's going to speak about that in verses 11 through 17. And what about work? How many of you have worked for a crooked boss? I worked in the base, in the military base years ago. For 19 years, every three years, we changed the, the, a, new, a new boss would come in. Uh, as military, the American military would change, we go from one base to another for every three or four years. So I had the wonderful privilege of having a new boss every three years. And sometimes it was a privilege because they were really good. I had a couple of them that was just a delight to work for them. But boy, others just, you know, I didn't want to go to work. Honey, why? Get up. Why don't you get up? You need to go to work. Why? We, we need food over the table. But you don't understand what I have to go through. Guy gets goes to the office in the morning and five years minutes later says, "This is what to do," and he goes to the gym for the rest of the day. You know, he's not in the office. So what do you do when the cat's not at home? What, what, what do the mice do? You know, you feel like I'm not going to work for somebody like that. But though Peter talks about the masters and the application here is, uh, you're not working for them. You're working for the Lord. Get it? And then you say, well, what else does Peter tell us to have hope in? He says, well, uh, also have submission in the home. Now, if you're married to a wonderful man, or a one married to a wonderful woman, that will probably not be difficult. But, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. What happens if you have, uh, you're married, you're a woman, you're married to a man that is uh, just, uh, you know, just gets in your nerves. I'm not going to ask for you to raise your hand. But he says, notice, that, wives, this is how you work at home. You say, this is how you, you continue putting your eyes on the Lord. Be, be submission, you know, show submission, both the, the husband to the Lord, you to the husband, kids, all you to your mother and father. Almost a similar message that we see in Colossians. And what about church? Submission to the church? Oh, if it's a royal Baptist church, there's no problem because everybody in the church is perfect. Amen? amen. Nobody said amen. <laughs> you say, Brother Sammy, you are very sarcastic this afternoon. I'm, I'm only kidding. But this is my way of catching your attention. Even when things don't go right in the church, even when there's problematic people, even when uh, you know, you feel like holding somebody by the collar and just, mm, just make sure you submit yourself one to another. Okay, Peter, I've had enough. No, I said, no, no, you haven't had enough. We're only chapter 3. And so Peter keeps on writing to those, both in the first century and to us in the 21st century. And he says, that was the best part. Get ready for the worst. Are you ready for the worst? You thought that was difficult, but Peter now says, Oh, by the way, you need God's grace for suffering. Chapter 3, verse 13, all the way to the end, to chapter 5, verse 11. He's going to talk to us about how we can do this. And he gives us five very good ways to do it. Make Christ the Lord of your life. Verses 13 to 22. See, it goes back to verse 1. Listen, Paul, I mean, sorry, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. If you don't get this one right, you're not going to get anything in the, in the epistle right. Are you, are you, see where, you see where I'm going with this? 
The only way you're going to survive and you're going to give a testimony all the way to the end is if you let the Lord be Lord in your life. If you're not, if that is not right, nothing else will be right. And then as it turns into chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, it says, Ah, oh, by the way, and when you do this, I'll have the right attitude. Come on, Peter, give me a break. I'll do what you tell me to do, but I'm not going to be happy doing it. I says, no, you're going to be happy doing it. Have you ever had a kid, a teenager in your home, you go into the room, it seems like a, an atomic bomb has gone off. Everything is everywhere. And you tell them, have you seen your room? And they look and say, yeah, it's my room, perfect. But that room likes, looks like a tornado has just gone over it. Please clean it up. But well, Mama, I had to go to, uh, I, I have a, I have to see my friends. So yeah, I have to clean your room. And you, you go into discussion with them. Have you, have you had this kind of thing going, going on in your home? And finally you get them to do what you told them to do, and they do it with this, with the push list, you know. I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do it on the outside, but I'm not gonna do it on the inside. I'm gonna, and the says, Lord said, no, no, you're gonna be happy about it. You're gonna have it the proper attitude. Are you seeing why I had difficulties with this epistle? <laughs> Brother Tim is a sneaky guy. He set me up. I think he really did. He said, Brother Sam is going to get into it. I don't know if you thought this way, but I kind of, I'm, this is what I'm thinking right now. Maybe when I finish, I'm, I'll, I'll be hugging him all the way. But right now, I feel like Mm. <laughs> he said, Sammy, if you're looking for a suggestion, why don't you consider preaching from the book of First Peter? He preached from it before, probably several times. He knew what it was all about. And I don't know if he thought it this way, but, you know, as I'm looking into this, and I thought, uh, I would have chosen something a little easier. I'll talk to you later about this. <laughs> Have the right attitude, chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. Then this is the only way you're going to glorify his name. Verses 4, uh, uh, 12 through 19, glorify the name of Christ. How is this going to be done? Make sure that whatever you do, you do it for him. Not for your husband, not for the government, not for your kids, not for, not for the people. Although you do it for the people, for other people, but you're really doing it. The motivation comes from the Lord. Glorify the name of the Lord. And then in chapter 5, as soon as he opens chapter 5, verse 1 through 6, he says, hey, uh, and make sure you're not going to wait. <laughs> wait for Christ's coming. It might take a little long. It's like he's saying, you know, okay, Lord, I'll do this, but make sure it doesn't last, it doesn't, it doesn't I don't have a long, I don't have to wait a long time. No, Peter is saying, no, you need to wait it out. You need to make sure you wait all the way until it happens, until the Lord does come. Make sure you don't set tent here on earth, permanent dwelling, but that you keep your eyes, your hopes, in that future place, which is heaven, where Christ reigns. And then, ending the chapter in verse, chapter 5, verse 7 through 11, he says, this is how you do it. Now, do you see how difficult this is? And Peter says, this is how you do it. Not because he's like, do what I say, not what I do. No, he says, this is how I learned to do it. Depend on Christ's grace. You're going to need the grace of Christ every single day. This is miraculous Christian living, folks in his crawl uh, form. This is like saying, live in an impossible way, in a very difficult world, and I'm going to show you that it's possible. And the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I was ready to start preaching from verse 3, I had to go back and Consider why is Peter starting this way? Is this an accident? Is this something that Peter's just, you know, when, I was, when my mom taught me how to write letters, it was 
I said, Mom, how do I start a letter? It's, you know, you see how difficult it is to start a letter? Do you say, dear beloved? You say, how do you start a letter? Hi, you know, how do you start? Uh, and she would say, uh, querida hermana, espero que estés bien, nosotros bien, gracias a Dios. Every letter that I ever wrote started this way. <laughs> so, you know, I just do the same, just change the name. Sometimes when I'm writing letters in the internet, I do the same thing, and I'm talking to somebody I don't even know. I said, no, you can't say beloved. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, no, Peter's not doing this just by, I'm a good secretary, I know how to write. No, no, he's saying, no, this is, this, is, this is important, folks. Again, everything in the epistle hangs on this first sentence. Please get that down. It took me a while for me to, it, actually, you know, I was all the way in chapter 3, enjoying everything, and I thought, you know, everything that Peter's asking me is just impossible. How am I going to preach this? How am I going to convince folks in the church that this is, this is actually possible? So I had to kind of pray, and the Lord said, hey, dummy, check verse 1. <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you my soul. This is how I function. I'm in my office preparing these things, and, and it's like I'm, I'm struggling, and I'm chewing on this, and I'm like, Lord, how am I going to put this in the form of a message? And it's like uh, my like my old brother, my biggest brother, my oldest brother used to do this. <laughs> Pay attention. Uh, it all depends on this. And when I say old brothers, I had eight of them. Nine? Eight of them, yeah. <laughs> so I had a lot of eyes uh, to look at. Now, you say, okay, brother, so yeah, I think I get the point. I think I get the point. No, you don't. <laughs> if you do, wonderful. Brother Tim gave us an illustration of a bridge. And I'd like to give you a story just so that I can kind of close this message. Just sit back and imagine this scenario. You go on a plane. You go over the madness of the jungle, and then the motor starts failing, and the, and the plane starts going down. And you're going, oh my, God, this is, I'm dead. And the, the, the plane crashes, and you end up with no harm at all. You get out of the plane, realizing that a miracle just took, just took place, and then you look around, and you find yourself surrounded by a massive jungle, and everything in that jungle wants to kill you. Kind of like an Australian in the outback. Made me feel right at home. And uh, you're wondering, well, I need to get to safety. I wouldn't want to live here. Because eventually, if it's not the mosquitoes, it's going to be an anaconda digesting me or something else, a crocodile in my leg. I need to move fast. I, I can't make a nice little hotel here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, retire. No, no, you, you move on, and every day as you're walking through the jungle, you're finding that things are just becoming more and more difficult. At the end of the day, you, you kind of think, wow, well, I've made it through one more day. <laughs> you wake up in the morning full of mosquito bites, thinking, I need to get out of here. And you keep on walking one day after another until you finally, you think you're out of danger, and you, you come across this gulf, this precipice. There's uh, another side to it, uh, 25 meters away. You think, finally, hope, I'm out of here. All I have to do is jump and get to the other side. What hope would you have trying to jump 25 meters, Brother John? Oh! <laughs> Back in the cartoons. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that, that, that's not going to work. You're going to look around and you see a little bridge over there. Oh, a wonderful bridge over there. Finally, I have, I, I can get out of here. And you go to that bridge and you realize it was built 100 years ago. The boards are rotten. The ropes are dry and brittle. And they're going, everything is just, you know, that it's not going to hold your weight. But you say, well, at least I have hope. This bridge is going to get me to the other side. And then 
you think uh, now this your hope is built on a bridge that cannot hold you and your hope collapses and then you think well then I'm dead meat. And you look around a little bit more and you find that just a, a little bit further you find a wonderful wide bridge that was built with concrete and steel beams and, and it, it could hold a tank. And you think, finally, something I can put my hope on, cross this gulf and finally get into safety. You don't have, you don't need a lot of hope to, to be able to cross that bridge because you know that it is solid. You don't have need even a lot of faith because it's not about you having hope or even faith. It's about who's holding it. See, you get the point. You can cross that bridge completely uh, um, with no care in the world because you know that you know that you know that that bridge is going to hold you. That bridge, folks, is Jesus. Christ our Lord. And when the, the disciples that are scattered all over the world read receive this letter, they need to understand that while they're in that jungle and things seem to be wanting to devour them, and every day is just full of hardships, they can keep on moving, they know that one day, you know, that there's this bridge that I can cross. That will get me to safety. All that to say this. I came across a very interesting article. It says the mission agency that was monitoring the church in the People's Republic of China, as thousands of believers, what drew them to faith in Christ. If you know anything about China, I went there, spent 10 days with my wife. You can talk about anything, but don't talk about Christ unless you want to end up in trouble. But you know that the church is growing in China? But, so this mission agency, the monitors were saying, what do you see these Chinese people coming to faith? Especially when it can mean demotion, persecution, marginalization, and even imprisonment. This is what would end, they would end up with. And of course, many answers were given, but the one answer that was given most often, let get hold to your seats, was the joy, the joy of the understanding they're not in the Caribbean enjoying a pina colada or anything like that under a palm tree. They are in deep persecution. It was the joy in the lives of believers with whom they came in contact, such joy that made them envious. And then curious and eventually receptive. So, folks, as we study the letter of Peter and read, then we read the newspapers or turn on the television or go into the internet and watch what's going on in the world. If you end up saying, Oh no, what am I going to do? Honey, we need to sell the house and find some. Lost piece of property that we can buy and build some uh, uh, bunker and hide. I mean, this is not going good. This is not, and let's buy it. You've spent the rest of the money we have, make sure that we have enough food for the next 10, 20 years because, honey, eventually this is going to explode. If you're, a, if, if you're a Christian and that's what you feel like, and believe me, I felt like it. <laughs> I, I see things as they are turning out and I think, Maybe that's not a bad idea after all. But if we end up panicking or get angry, like angry not to get a baseball bat, and become resentful, if this is a reaction, we're not heading in the right direction. So Peter writes in this first letter, in the face of very fierce testing, very fierce adversity, and he says, hey, when things get really rough, oh, what a tremendous blessing this is. You know, again, it's very easy for me to stand up here and say this, but when you're facing 
this level of persecution, where you have to leave your home, where you you probably won't have a pillow to rest your head on for many, many months, and maybe you don't have to conform yourself with just a piece of bread because you're not get, you don't have enough money to buy anything. Everybody wants to get rid of you. If you're dealing with that kind of level of persecution, then the last message that you're ready to hear is rejoice. But notice what he says in chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But rejoice, and the line that, Peter said, he's going to do this several times just to awaken us to this truth, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Now, if you're suffering because of your own stupidity, then that's different. But if it's because you're following the Lord and you're giving a faithful testimony, then smile, you're on the right track. So it says, rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, in other words, when the bridge is finally there, ye may be glad also with exceed, now let's not joy now, this is exceeding joy. Come on, over the bridge! So if you're reviled for the name of Christ, then you are blessed. Amen. I know you're not accustomed to doing it. Uh, you know, where I come from, back in Madrid, and some of the churches in the States, it's quite common to give an amen to the preacher because they say, I agree with you. It's like, yeah. And by the way, this is biblical too. Just look at the book of Nehemiah and you'll see it immediately there. Amen, amen, they said some several times. So to this truth, we can say amen. That is, you were filled with a sense of satisfied joy. Then if you move over to chapter 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 14, it goes and says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, What's the next line? All together, read it aloud so that it sinks in. Happy are ye. Are you sure, Peter? Give me some good news to be happy about. You know, it's my imagination just, just wanders. I need to do something about this. I think in terms of images. And it's like somebody comes to you and says, I got news for you. I got good news and bad news. Uh, okay, give me uh, the good news first. Uh, things are going to get really tough. That's the good news? Yeah, so what's the bad news? And uh, we might not survive. So how are we going to respond to that? You say, wow, what good news we just received. It, it says, you are, happy are you? But it's not just because we don't know what's going on, because but we know what's going on. Notice it says, for the, spirit of, uh, of, for the Spirit of glory and of God rested upon you, and on their part he is, he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. In other words, what greater privilege to suffer beside the Lord Jesus Christ as we give testimony? J.J. was telling me just a moment ago, he says, I've had to be, be feeling well, I think you still give testimony. People don't even listen to me, they don't pay attention, but I still do it. I said, praise the Lord. Let's keep doing that until the end. So here's the message. Peter says, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not the immature Peter that would just open his mouth only to take the right foot out and put the next foot in. No, I've learned through this. It's been 30 years. And what tremendous years they were. Years of suffering for Christ. But I don't regret living that way. Because my Lord was with me all the way. His promise that day when he told us 30 years ago that he would be with us always was true. What fellowship I've enjoyed with my Savior in these years. And friends, as you open the letter and Peter says, 
Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. I was in some of these places when I went to Turkey. So I could see the places in my mind. And then he goes on. It says, look at verse 3, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness, heaviness through manifold temptations, that is, trials. Peter's saying, hey, guys, don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> I had a fish, uh, a bass, almost looked real on a piece of board. It was mechanical. It had a battery on it. I bought it in the flea market. It was real cute because it had a sound detector. And as you walked in the office, and you said, hey, honey, you be happy. And the thing would start moving. Don't worry, be happy. And it started making, you know, it kind of reminded me of that. That, that fish is dead and is on the board, and he's hand singing, don't worry, be happy. And Peter says something similar. Folks, let this sink in. I'm not just preaching. Mm -hmm. This is something that we need. And if you don't need it now, you're going to need it for sure. As he closes the chapter in chapter 5, he says in verse 12, I have written briefly. Are you kidding me, Peter? <laughs> briefly? Five chapters? And he says, I've written this so that you can take note. I'm exhorting you, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. So in other words, those of you who are being redeemed by grace, you belong to a glorious God, and therefore Peter writes so that you who are in the midst of a changing world, you won't lose sight of God's grace or stop living out the gospel of grace. You can sum it up that way. You say, okay, Sammy, what are you doing today? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to say? I'm just trying to wake your appetite. I don't know what happened to me this morning. I'm going to close in a few minutes, but my heart was pumping at this moment like it was going to come out of my chest. I thought I was going to be able to finish the message. That normally doesn't happen to me. But I got so excited. I was saying, wow, you know, this is, this is, you know, Sammy, if they hear you or not, it's okay. But make sure you, you, you pay attention to this. Because you're going to be the first one to need it. I could hear the pump, uh, pumping in my head. When I got down and uh, uh, finished praying and sat down, I had to sit down because I thought I was going to just fall over. It was because the Lord was saying, this is for you, buddy. And I hope that tonight you understand that this is for you too. To stand and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we really haven't gone into the in detail. We've just flown over this epistle. Kind of diving and going back up again, only get to only to get to the next point. But Lord, as we come to church in the next few months and open this book, I pray that we won't just be here to listen to God preach, but that we will have open hearts and be ready to receive the message that the Holy Spirit wants to give us, wants us to understand. You gave me this morning, this, uh, this message this morning to me, to me, Sammy, as I was trying to deliver it to the church. And I have a double portion of it this afternoon, but Lord, I do it with appreciation. Because I know that things Peter says here for me 
as well as for every other Christian. So Lord, I pray this afternoon that you will help us and prepare us as we dig into this chapter. And that as we open the truths in this book, Christian character will develop in us in such a way that when we actually start facing those trials, if needs so, as Peter says, we will rejoice. He's not talking about our clumsy stupidity when we don't listen to God and then get in trouble. He's talking about when we listen to God and get in trouble for following God. In that case, we can rejoice and be happy. I pray you will work in our church in the next in the, in the, in the weeks to go to come. And that Lord, you will help us get a better understanding of this wonderful passage. And next week, as we study the individual who wrote it, we will see that it's not a super executive who had it all together and never made any mistakes. He's a He's a man that not only denied you three times, he failed you many other times afterwards. But he understood that after every failure, you get up and trust you, keep on going. It is not the fall that we need to be worried about, it's, it's not getting up that we need to be worried about. And you know, in order for us to get up, we need to have our eyes set on the right person. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Lord, help us um, um, check into the, this man we call Simon Peter. Only to understand why you chose him to write this letter. And then we'll get into the one rep he's representing. He's an apostle. Not just one more sin, but a special apostle. One who had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One who had walked with you for three years. <clears throat> one who understood what it was to follow you, even after he failed. And you gave him the message, and it's a message not just to <clears throat> the Messianic Jews back 2,000 years ago, or the Gentile Christians who were persecuted. It goes beyond them. It goes to us 2,000 years later. So, be dear Lord, I pray that you will pierce our heart and help us understand first who you are truly. Because once we understand that you are Kurios, the, the Lord, God himself made flesh, the Messiah, the Christos, the one who was anointed by God, the, the God-man, who is Jesus, the one who God saves through. Once we understand that and get that down, then we'll be ready for the rest of the epistle. I pray, Lord, that you will Bless this church as we open up this great book. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.